Welcome to Let's Go Minnesota. We're hiking up to Chimney Rock and over to Inspiration Point at Whitewater State Park today. And I'm here with Sean, Dave, and Curtis. And we're halfway up the stairs to the top of the bluff. Let's go check it out, Minnesota. Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. I am definitely ready to get a workout today. And actually, it's kind of humid, so I think we're gonna be working up a sweat. It's good, good stuff. Let's do it. Hey guys. Oh. Let's go. Let's go. This is pretty. Sean, tell me, tell me which river is running through here. This is the middle branch of the Whitewater River. Okay. Oh, it's sandy through here. Yeah, neat sandstone outcrop here. Okay. With lots of kids' names. Yeah, I see that. Are we there yet? How many steps are, are there? 645. 645? I think you just made that up. Yeah, I did. Hey, we have just been hiking the stairs and there's a lot of them and it's kind of warm out today, but it's a good workout. So tell me, Sean, what can we expect to see at the top of these stairs? Well, we're climbing the bluff here and at the top, we're gonna see a dry um, outcrop prairie. Okay. So a fairly unique native plant community in Minnesota. Oh. And we've done a lot of restoration work on this particular bluff. What kind of prairie did you say that was? Uh, dry bedrock bluff prairie is the um, official name of what we're going to see at the top. Dry bedrock bluff prairie. What are these? Yeah. Dinosaur eggs, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a gall of some sort. Is that what it is? Yeah, I believe from an oak tree. Cool. It does look like a dinosaur egg. <laughs> yeah, it's creepy. It's funny. Maybe. And beautiful. Maybe right? it is. Yeah. This is beautiful up here. The prairies are really beautiful right now. You can see all the red hue of the prairie grasses in front of us. The oh, yeah. Yellow golden rods. The white is a bone set. And most of the purple and white flowers are asters. Okay. So the prairie is actually very pretty at this time of year. This is beautiful. Then we have the grasses. And yeah, the grasses, these reddish tinged grass. That's almost pure little blue stem. Okay. And this is actually big blue stem. Okay, so why is it red if it's called blue stem? It is or why bluish. is it called blue stem if it's red? I uh, should say it is bluish most of the summer. If you look at the basal leaves here, that has a bluish tinge to it, and it is more so in the summer. But okay. in the fall, most of the prairie grasses turn a golden red, goldish brown color. Wildfires or Native American sapphires would back onto these ridges and maintain, maintain this as prairie. Oh, wow. So in this particular site, you can see some stumps here and some brush. We've cut the trees and brush out of here and burned it multiple times trying to restore the bluff prairie. What would we expect to see after 20 years? I think after 20 years, you'll see this kind of prairie vegetation all the way up through the hill. And then looking down the hill where you see a little bit more tree cover, it's going to be more of an open canopy. You'll be able to see right through that woods and have just some bigger oak trees and the smaller trees and shrubs 
will be killed by multiple fires. And we do see a lot of buckthorn and invasive shrub mm -hmm. down there. And hopefully with enough cutting and fire, we'll get that under control as well. Okay. How's that going to affect the wildlife? Well, we burn um, at intervals to allow, um, you know, some of the invertebrates to recolonize, recolonize sites and at different times of year. So we minimize impacts to most of the, um, to maxim or minimize impacts to most animals. How does this uh, prairie differ from the goat prairies that you, that you see downstream? We have photos of this site from at the beach when CCC was doing their work. Okay. This, this was a bluff prairie, a goat prairie. It oh. was bald. There were hardly any trees on this ridge. Very interesting indeed. It's kind of rocky up here. Yeah. How do you keep it controlled on a bluff like this? So what we're walking on is the fire break um, oh, okay. for this burn. Wow. And so we're burning everything downhill to our right. So when we burn this particular bluff, what we'll do is use a leaf blower and clear the leaves off of this and maybe uh, use a brush saw and widen it a little bit. And then we're essentially starting the fire right here and letting it back down the hill to control it. And then we wrap around the bottom and the fire runs up the hill and it runs into our line up here that we already burned and essentially goes out and the burn is completed. That's amazing. And so this is wide enough to stop the burn from jumping? It is. It's essentially wide enough to light it right here and let it back because the fire backs down the hill really, really slowly. Okay. Um, if we start it at the bottom and just let it run uphill, no, it would not be wide enough. It would jump right over the top of this and we'd have a wild fire. Okay. What is this? Uh, bur oak, I think. Looks like it. A lot of the bur oaks, they rot out, but then they, they have this outside layer still intact so they can survive even if they're completely hollow. And a lot of them do. So Sean, I'm curious, what kind of wildlife would you find here in the park? In the spring, there are obviously lots of migrant um, songbirds that move through. Okay. Um, some of our resident wildlife are the same culprits you'd expect, you know, deer and coons and squirrels, although there are flying squirrels in this part of the state. Oh, really? So that's an interesting squirrel. Um, <laughs> have you ever had one fly by you? <laughs> no, okay. but we have, I have seen them in at least two state parks okay. in the southeast. Do they have wings? They have skin that at least mimic a wing. Okay, very cool. Super squirrels. Super squirrel. Oh, it doesn't look like we want to fall off of here. Wow. That is a long ways down. If we look at the horizon there, the first ridge, um, we see a few pine trees sticking up against almost at the horizon. Over the top of that is Trout Run Valley, which is a tributary to the Whitewater. Okay. Any trout in Trout Run? <laughs> There are trout and trout run, there's brown trout, and there's some native strain brook trout. Okay. Any fly fishing that happens here? Yeah, fly fishing is very popular at Whitewater State Park. Okay. It is so hot, I have sweat dripping down my cheek. Wait, so where's the beach? That's the beach right over there? That's the beach. I think we should go to the swimming beach today. <laughs> Whoa. Is this Inspiration Point? Because it could be. Where are we right now? Chimney Rock is right below us. Oh man, I am looking out at an extremely beautiful valley with the Whitewater River below. Dave, what are we seeing right now? This is uh, Chimney Rock, which is, um, it's got, it's sort of hollow on the inside so you can actually crawl in and look out the other side and get a view of the river. Wow. Um, I don't think I will be doing that. But, oh, uh, why not? Brenda said she would. <laughs> that is something Brenda would do, actually. <laughs> uh, Curtis, are you feeling inspired at all? Anytime I get out in the woods, it's inspiring. Yeah. I like the I like seeing the wildlife. We've seen a lot of turkey vultures and some hawks, and then um, you know all the plant life and the 
there was like a strange oak, gnarly oak tree back there that was kind of cool. So I like kind of, I don't know, the variety of nature and the sculptural forms that you see around. Chimney rocks, pretty impressive. So I haven't seen any of the rattlesnakes yet. Yeah, you know, it's a real treat. It's a um, rare event to actually see a rattlesnake, so we'd be lucky hikers if we see one. Lucky. <laughs> as long as I see it Truly, from a distance. Yeah, you're lucky if you get to see a rattlesnake. Because they are poisonous, right? They're venomous, um, but they truly are a symbol of, you know, wilderness for southeast Minnesota. So um, they're out there. Um, we have some at Whitewater State Park, but um, you're a lucky hiker to see one. Have you ever seen one? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, we do some habitat management and monitoring of rattlesnakes here. Where, do, where would you see them? Would you see them out there sunning on the rock or? Yeah, and this is critical habitat for timber rattlesnakes. So we're at the northern edge, northern edge of their range. Okay. So they need to come out of their den sites and thermoregulate, get in the sun to warm up when it's early spring, late fall. So this provides that kind of habitat where they can come out, lay in the rocks, um, even get partially underneath some shrubs so they have partial sun, partial shade. So absolutely, this is critical habitat for timber rattlesnakes. So what do you, how many do you think are in the park now? Is it hard to... it, it's hard to say, but I'm guessing 50 would be, I'd be happy if there were 50 snakes left. Wow, that's not very many at all. I'm going to keep an eye out. Because I'm feeling lucky today. All right. <laughs> We're almost ready to jump the gully there. But... Oh, cool. This is definitely a much better view of it down here. Yeah. Well, it seems like it's shifting a little. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah, it is moving. <laughs> here we are. I am inside of Chimney Rock at Whitewater State Park. Only for the real daring people do they crawl into the hole. No, actually, it's not that bad. There's actually a lot of room in here. Check it out. And you know what? It's nice and cool in here because it is hot outside. Southeastern Minnesota is one of the few places you will find the bashful timber rattlesnake. Clarissa Schroten from the Zolman Zoo tells us more about this rare reptile. Hi, my name is Clarissa Schroden. I am the naturalist here at Oxbow Park and Zolman Zoo. Today we are going to be talking about the timber rattlesnake, the only one venomous snake that we now see in Minnesota. They are cold-blooded, also called ectotherms, meaning then that during the winter times here in Minnesota, they cannot survive slithering around in the snow, so they do actually retreat into hibernaculums or a hibernation den. When they're not hibernating, then they're slithering around looking for the prey that they feast on. And that would be anything from small mammals, a lot of times mice and voles, and maybe some shrews and moles if they want to, but also it can range up to gopher size too, or ground squirrels. They have pits on the fronts of their faces that takes in heat, and that senses where the heat is when they're out in the wild, and they can find out where that heat source is coming from. Then they'll stick out their tongue, using a fork-like tongue to stick out and taste particles of the air. As they taste those particles of the air, they're bringing it back inside of their mouth into an organ that's called the Jacobson's organ. This Jacobson's organ is able to sort out those particles and be able to tell you this is food, or this is human, or this is way too big of prey. They inject venom into that prey that they're going for to eat. Then we actually call it a venomous snake because it's actually injecting that. It's not poisonous because poison would be something that we'd consume. And then they're able to swallow it completely whole. They don't have to do any kind of chewing. Even though they have the teeth and they're fully equipped, those teeth actually help push that food down their throat. Timber rattlesnakes should have a rattle on their tail. The rattle is made up of keratin or protein similar to our fingernails. And if you know how easy your fingernails break off, a rattle can also break off too. When they are first born and hatched out of their egg, they are only about a foot long and about the thickness of a pencil. They can grow anywhere from five feet, sometimes even more. So if you're ever out hiking in southeast Minnesota and you do come across one of these timber rattlesnakes, the best thing to do is give a big berth of distance. A timber rattlesnake can strike a third to half of its body length. 
I'm Clarissa Schroten with Oxbow Park and Zolman Zoo. I encourage you all to get out and experience those great Minnesota animals. Yeah. Nice and woodsy, nice and cool. So is this Inspiration Point? We are not at Inspiration yet. We're over, no, maybe halfway around. We're gonna follow this ridge line around to the far side and as it starts to slope down, we'll hit Inspiration Point right there. Nice. The deep valleys here are created from thousands of years of just mostly water erosion. Okay. So the, the river itself has carved um, its course through the bluffs here. Yeah, and there's a kind of a plateau above and most of the rivers just wind their way through and over time have eroded down to their current elevation. Here's a nice, uh, this is a lot of what I carve. Oh, interesting. Really? What kind of tree is this? Uh, it's a white pine, eastern white pine, I think. Is that the kind you typically are carving with? Yeah, a lot of, a lot of the stuff that I get comes from northern Minnesota. Okay. This tree, you're looking at maybe 18 inch diameter. Tell me what kind of art you do. Um, I do, you know, wood sculpture. I use power tools, I use chainsaws, um, die grinders and grinders. I use some knives and chisels and, uh, and stuff, but uh, mostly my art revolves around like thinking quickly and making hopefully good decisions. Yeah. You know, a lot of people get the, they, there's this like great stigma around chainsaw carving. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. like this crafty thing where you just carve bears and eagles. Yeah. See, but that's not the truth anymore. Okay. In the last 10 years, the equipment's changed so much. I think, just cut it through there and see what happens. I started thinking about this red-tailed hawk. It's kind of banking on the wind, um, suspended on that chimney rock. But then as I thought about it, I was like, well, what if we put a, like a trout down on the bottom of that, you know, kind of as the bottom of the canyon. So then we'd have just kind of a good representation of three things that existed in that space. So we got air and water. And I was like, well, this is kind of like the four elements of nature here, really, because we've got the water, we've got the earth, we've got the air, and then I was like, you know, what's the fire element? And, I was, and then it kind of, it hit me two ways. First, I was like, oh, they burned the prairie up the side of that thing. And then I thought, oh, it's the chimney rock. It could easily be a fireplace as well. So we actually got that, the, all those elements naturally are just occurring in there. And so there's kind of a cool balance to it. Basically, to start these, I generally am looking just for the overall shape that everything fits into. I don't really care about the details right now. So we're just gonna go after it and see what happens. We start with the big chainsaws and try to get rid of as much of the big piece of wood as we can um, so we can you know, relax and hold the little chainsaws basically and carve all the details and everything. With these carving bars, they allow you to move and to turn. And so what I'm thinking, I'm thinking of this overall shape and I'm a little bit impatient. In the style that I'm developing, I want everything to happen here on this piece of wood. And so the more dynamic I work on it, the more dynamic the marks are that are left behind. You know, I went to school for art. I'm pursuing this as an art form and I'm pursuing it as a long-term art form. So what I'm, I'm going into territory that's not very well marked. Most people that have done this form of chainsaw carving were not fine artists. But I'm trying to figure out like, how can I get there with this art form? And it's just, it's more fun that way, challenging. And so we got the basic form blocked out. We've got uh, something we can put, make a hawk out of up here. We got chimney rock, put some fish down here. So stay tuned to see how it turns out.
Part of my thing is bringing art to people and not just having it show up, but actually having the whole process, the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, represented. Because I think it's honest to have that um, human factor in art, because a lot of times we, we try to hold it up to this lofty status when actually we're just people, artists are just people that have developed these skills and or have talents or however they chase down this thing. And part of the connection with somebody with an art piece is that humanity. We're just exchanging that. That's all it is. I love it. It's the connections. It's the connections, yeah. Feels nice and hot out here. In the sun again. It's nice to have that shade for a little bit. Ooh, would not want to fall off of that. Point. <laughs> Yikes. It's inspiring. Wow. Right? It's very inspiring. This is kind of crazy right yeah, here. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So we said That's... you got to fall the right way. Look at the twisted up cedar tree. Yeah. That's cool too. Finally arrived at Inspiration Point. Uh, it's just a beautiful view of trout run up here, um, dry run this way and the middle branch that way. It's just kind of right in the center of the park, just beautiful views no matter what direction you look. This is not the true inspiration point historically. It's actually a point back there on the old trail. It was what the CCC actually labeled as inspiration. This was called like breezy point. But <laughs> since we don't go to that other cliff, this is forever known as inspiration now. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. This is gorgeous. What is that bluff over there called? That's P Precipice Bluff, the big cliff you see there. And that's where like the peregrine falcons are nesting now. Oh. On that cliff. There are no trails going up there. There are no trails. Okay. Yep. Wow, oh, this is beautiful. And then, yeah, this is Trout Run that we talked about going up this way. And this is Dry Run going this way. So here we are. We are standing right by Inspiration Point. It is absolutely beautiful. We are surrounded by bluffs and valleys and the Whitewater River below. And it's a little adrenaline pumping too because right next to the trail uh, happens to be a very, very steep drop. Um, we're definitely on top of a cliff face here. And so definitely watch your footing, but it is absolutely worth the hike up here. It's beautiful. Well, how many miles of hiking trails are here, do you think? If I remember right, eight or nine. Okay. Are there cross-country ski trails here? There used to be quite a few cross-country ski trails in the bottoms, but the last several years since snow has become um, not so dependable, yeah. uh, the park has become much more of a winter hiking and snowshoeing destination okay. than cross-country skiing. Does anybody do any winter camping here? Yeah, there are, there's almost always a camper or two out there, so it's pretty fun to see. I love it. It's great. You guys want bobcats still probably here, or there do are you? Bobcats. Are there? Yeah, around. Oh. Um, I've not seen one here, but actually, right here is good. 20 miles from here, um, we had one on a deer camp. Oh, okay. So cool. Around. That's awesome. Yeah. And but you must have lots of coyotes and what about mountain lions? Do you guys get those too? And then Sasquatch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not sure the weight rating on the stairs system. <laughs> oh, we're gonna test the limit. Who's counting the stairs? Just when you thought you were going down, you go up. I think you took a wrong turn. Feels nice and cool here. It's been a great day. It's a little warm out. I'm pretty excited that we are approaching the Trout Run Creek. I think we're gonna hang out here a little bit and maybe dip our toes in the water. It's awesome. Have you been down here fly fishing? 
Yeah, I've been in the trees a lot. Okay. Yeah. Caught any fish? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, you guys should do this. Feels good? It feels good. Seriously. Are there, uh, are there other types it's of trout? It's actually pretty here? chilly. Like, there are some brown trout. Surprisingly trials, chilly. Rainbows, I think, are primarily in the middle branch. Thanks for joining us on our adventure. It's been a great day. A bit warm, but definitely a great day. See you next time on Let's Go Minnesota. High five, man. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. It's awesome. And now my feet are freezing. <laughs> oh my. It is ice cold. Holy cow. You gotta be in the water. <laughs> I'm not going in that freezing cold water. High five. That's not a high five. You guys want to do high fives? There you go. <laughs> we put it back very frequently. Yeah, I hear it. I hear everything. <laughs> Can you take the volume down to about half? It's good that you're talking, but it does carry up here in the where the air is thin or something. <laughs> I see a Matt Bloom walking through the background. Hi, Matt. <laughs> Ooh. Don't back up, man. Yeah. Are you going to film us jumping off or? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that depends. Jump off your fire. <laughs>